<laughs> okay. Hi, Elizabeth. So how are we going to do this? So I, I thought uh, it would be great for people to know what you are what you think your greatest achievements are and that you can elaborate a little bit on those so that everyone uh, gets an idea of what what at least your personal view of uh, your life achievement uh, really is um but it, i thought it would also be nice uh, especially like for for younger uh, audience of this video to get an idea of uh what you were struggling with so what what your uh, life was really like while you you were building up to uh the career that, that you currently have so we, because if we look backwards then it all looks as if it made total sense as, as if, if it had been like one path that you were uh, walking on and towards like this one goal but I guess this is not what, what it was right it was mm -hmm. So in one of our conversations, you, you said it was more like an uphill battle. So what exactly were you battling against? So you, you started as a as a general linguist, right? Like a generative linguist. Right. Well, first, first of all, let me say uh, hello to everyone. And Kirsten, thank you uh, for asking me to uh, talk with you about these things. Um, all right, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, it was a long time ago. <laughs> I completed my dissertation in 1964, so a very long time ago. And uh, for those of you who recall that period, you will remember that that was the year that uh, Chomsky's Aspects of the Theory of Syntax came out. Uh, and syntax, Chomsky and syntax was all the rage. My dissertation was actually uh, a generative take on an old text, an Alfredian text from Old English from about the year 880. Uh, it wasn't very good because I didn't have any advisors who knew anything much about uh, transformational grammar. <laughs> okay. And it was in the transformational mode that actually preceded aspects of the theory of syntax. Uh, I just mentioned that because I think it, it uh, is helpful to see where I started. As you say, uh, I didn't start where I ended up, uh, which is good. I think it's good to be able to change and it's just good to um, reconsider uh, what's important for one's research. So I started there, it was 1964. Uh, that was a time when uh, not only Chomsky's syntax was really important, but it was a time when a lot of people, younger people were saying, why should we study the past? Mm -hmm. There's no point in studying dead poets, for example. Mm -hmm. The saying this now too, right? <laughs> <laughs> now too. Uh, it was a very, very active uh, protest at the time mm -hmm. okay. against historical work. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I was interested in historical things, uh, in part, in looking back, uh, because it's intriguing to see how language changes. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, these days, uh, it's important to see that there's nothing so-called pure in language. It's always changing. Mm -hmm. The speakers are always changing. And the speakers, demographically, are hugely mixed. Mm -hmm. The history of English is the history of immigrations to England in the first place, rather Scandinavians, mm -hmm. uh, by Germanic peoples to start with in the sixth century, and then the Scandinavians in the eighth and ninth, and then the French or Anglo-Normans in the 12th, 11th and 12th. And it's a continuous long-term 
cultural mix, mm -hmm. which has created the English that we now have. And it continues to be a cultural mix. And some people are very resistant to that idea. But if you study the history of English, there's no way you can get away from it. Yeah. And so uh, that's one of the things that has kept me doing historical linguistics. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of uphill battle was your question. Uh, one of the things, as I just said, was that people were very anti-history at the time. The other thing was that the only value to anything at the moment was uh, Chomsky and the syntax. Yeah. Well, I combined both in my dissertation, as I say, not in a very good manner, but I think that illustrates the way I've been thinking, which is I always want to try and do something a little risky and a little novel. Mm -hmm. And uh, over time, I moved away from Chomsky and syntax. My first book was on the history of English in the 1970, and uh, it was cast in Fillmore's uh, frame theory, mm -hmm. which was a departure. And it was out of the book was out of date, of course, by the time it came out. <laughs> it's just I think par for the course. Uh, but that was an initial move away from uh, transformational grammar, mm -hmm. which is where I started. And uh, over time, as I was looking at the text that I was working with, it struck me that there was something very interesting going on, which my first example was uh, while. Mm -hmm. While meant, still does mean, for a time, for mm -hmm. a period of time. It's referential. You can check whether there was a period of time. But it got to be used in late Middle English around 1400, 1500 in the meaning of although. And that fascinated me, and I thought about it for a while. And uh, somewhere around 1982, I'm jumping forward now, I published a paper that made mention of this and of what came to be the major uh, phenomenon in language change that I have focused on, which is that there's a, a lot of pragmatics that's associated with language change. Yeah. So although it's something that's entirely in the speaker's head, or uh, a, a shared experience with people's expectations about uh, certain states of affairs. And so this was something that I needed to give a name. Now in 1980, the idea of subjectivity was totally unacceptable. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, language change at the time was thought to be progress. And progress was supposed to be you become more rational over time. No, no, right. So how could you possibly <laughs> yeah. justify claim that language change often involves mm -hmm. subjective reinterpretation? Yeah. Uh, well, as I studied more uh, changes, I found more and more and more of it. Mm -hmm. Other people did too. And somebody once rather cutely said to me, oh, there's quite a cottage industry that you've <laughs> started here <laughs> with so many people looking at subjectification, also intersubjectification. But subjectification, I think, was the important thing for me. Uh, at the well, skipping forward to 1990, uh, Ron Langacker was talking about subjectivity and uh, subjectification in a very, very different way from what I was. He was talking about subjectivity in terms of construal. 
Yeah. I'm not denying that there's construal. However, and this is an important point about the way I think, uh, as linguists, we can't get into people's minds several centuries ago. <laughs> we can speculate. <laughs> No, we still can't actually. <laughs> uh, but I've not been into talking about construal in a historical way because I just don't think I can provide evidence for it. What I can provide is evidence for uh, changes in text. Mm -hmm. I sort of feel I'm coming back to where I was before, because I've been working on some other sets of concessives, all the same, just the same, at the same time. And maybe as an example, uh, one I love from 1854, was, these are late changes. Those all became concessives in the 19th century. So, um, I'm moving here from old English to late modern English. <laughs> uh, and late modern English hasn't been studied very much. So again, I'm trying to do something a little bit different. Uh, it's coming to be studied a lot, but anyway, for me, it's somewhat different to be looking at 19th century English. There's a nice example from 1854. Uh, when someone is talking about the death of his Stepson says, he wasn't mine, but I loved him all the same. Now that's ambiguous. Mm. I loved him the same way as I would have loved my own son, mm -hmm. is one way. And that is a literal interpretation of the same way. The other one is, I loved him nevertheless, even though he wasn't mine. So the context of the negation, it wasn't mine, uh, cues the concessive, I think. I mean, it's certainly possible to interpret it in a concessive way. So I, I think that's an example of how these invited inferences mm -hmm. come about. They come about not usually because of the inherent meaning of the word that's changing, but because of the context in which they are used. So in the case of same, I think one could say that there is also <laughs> inherent meaning because Tina Braban somewhere around 2010 said that if you bother to say that something is the same, the only reason for saying it's the same is that there's some question mm -hmm. yep. about its identity. And so, uh, I I would say that there's in this particular case uh, the inherent meaning in addition to the context helped and enabled the change. I don't know that. I just uh, think it is plausible. Uh, maybe I've strayed too far from your initial. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actually, you've touched upon so many uh, uh, aspects, like um, one thing uh, that you came from, uh, both like uh, in terms of genitive grammar, but also in uh, terms of case grammar or uh, mm -hmm. the uh, frames that uh, Chuck was wor working with. So the focus uh, at that time was con um, exclusively on the sentence. So um, everything that you were uh, working on is like draws on a much larger context and so uh, something that is kind of like a commonplace for us now but for for you back then was quite uh, a challenge right to to show that you have to take the the, the whole discourse uh, into account yes that that is a a very important point uh i must admit that when i developed my so-called theory of invited inferencing, I stated that negotiation of meaning was a key factor, mm -hmm. uh, but I never really studied 
the negotiation of meaning. I, I just studied the context. Uh, I've moved more toward the studying negotiation of meaning, but I'm still very much focused on discursive mm. context. Yeah. And sometimes the discursive concepts, context is quite distant. Uh, sometimes you have to go back three or four or five clauses mm -hmm. to find a motivation for, for example, and all the same. Yeah. Uh, motivation is almost always to be found. It's, some, it's part of the argument that the uh, person writing is making. Mm -hmm. uh, you expect this, but in fact you find something unexpected. But you have to go back to find the expectation. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, context, long distance context has become very important. Um, but then uh, you were also struggling uh, with just not having the data available, right? So that was well, another... initially, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Initially, one one had to uh, look at various texts, uh, and then the Helsinki Corpus appeared. Mm -hmm. um, I guess some thirty years ago, nineteen yeah. nineties. And it absolutely revolutionized my work. Mm -hmm. And I think it revolutionized most historical linguists' work. Now, Helsinki Corpus, if you know it, is small by today's standards. Mm -hmm. Very small by uh, today's standards. It's one and a half million words for a period old English, Middle English, early modern. And... That was replaced by many corpora. And the ones I use are uh, what's called Kumut, which is unpronounceable. <laughs> uh, it's the corpus of late uh, modern English mm -hmm. put together by uh, Hendrik uh, de Smet and many others. And that's 15 million words, and that's small too. And now we have Koha, the corpus of American English, historical American English, which is 450 million. And if we're going into modern, you know, contemporary English, we've got Koha, which is over a billion. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the opportunities for looking at uh, discursive context have expanded mm. very dramatically over my lifetime and over most people's lifetimes, actually. It's it's quite extraordinary how much data we are getting. And now for many other languages as well. And we were lucky for English. Because English had the Oxford English Dictionary, which is no corpus, but nevertheless, mm. it's a source of information yeah. and examples. And uh, then we had the Helsinki Corpus of English. And then we had Koha and Komet and all these Koka, all these English corpora. Mm. But now the Chinese corpora and Japanese corpora and, <laughs> and of course for German and many, many, many other languages. But this is all extremely recent. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, the... Uh, Advent of corpora just opened all kinds of new doors. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. We're totally unavailable. So um, when I ask you what, what you think your biggest achievements are, you said, um, or what the, what the uh, most important concepts are that you developed or shaped uh, over your, uh, uh, over time, is the invited inferences on the other uh, on the one hand and uh, subjectification on the other um so uh, while i also want you to give you to, the opportunity to say more about them 
I was really struck by uh, the, le the lack of occurrence of the words um, construction grammar or construction analyzation, uh, which I would associate you with. So is that not one of your achievements? <laughs> well, I think it's one. Uh, let me go back for a moment, uh, mm -hmm. if we have time. Uh, I think advantage inferencing does not require subjectification. Mm -hmm. But it certainly led me to subjectification. It led me to choose examples. We all choose our examples, after all. It led me to choose examples which showed subjectification, partly because, going back to what I said at the beginning, I like to do something novel. Not too many people at the time were thinking about that. Now, a lot of people are thinking about it. Uh, I'm very pleased that they're thinking about it and a lot more needs to be thought about because there are all kinds of issues. Now, you mentioned uh, constructionization. Well, uh, that's very recent. I did work on grammaticalization for a long time. That was basically the uh, only kind of historical linguistics in town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not the only, but a major one. Uh, and I had become, this is in the 90s and early 2000s, I had become a little bit dissatisfied with grammaticalization because, exciting though it is, and novel though it was, it, when people started working on it, it was rather narrow. Grammaticalization involves the development of grammatical items. We can argue what grammatical items are. Mm -hmm and has been much debated, but uh, it is narrow in the sense that it excludes work on topics like uh, in construction grammar, the sort of basic example, which is diatransitive. Mm -hmm. I gave John a book, and I gave a book to John. Yeah. That alternation is has nothing to do with grammaticalization except maybe two mm -hmm. <laughs> because two part of that changed somewhat but uh it's not a typical kind of example for grammaticalization mm -hmm. and i was also a little bit frustrated by the fact that though everybody I really do think everybody agreed that grammaticalization involved semantic change and grammatical, syntactic, morphological change. Mm -hmm. Life is short. <laughs> focus, <laughs> focus has to be to get in to do something well, you have to focus. And people focused on either form. Or meaning. Well, I focus mainly on meaning. Uh, some other people, uh, like uh, Hospital Muff, for example, focus primarily on form. There's nothing wrong with that, but it was frustrating mm -hmm. because I wanted to find some kind of way of talking about form and meaning. But I didn't really have an adequate model. So when construction grammar came along, <laughs> which it did in the late 90, 80s, 90s, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, Adele Goldberg wrote her book on construction grammar, which came out in 1995, I found a model for talking about both form and meaning mm -hmm. together. And that has been very important for me in constructionization because I have insisted, though not everybody who practices constructionization agrees, but I have insisted that constructionization involves change in both form and meaning. Mm -hmm. Now, in order for that to work, I have to say there are some changes to the constructionizations as a new construction has come into being. Mm -hmm. 
and other ones are what used to be called constructional changes, but uh, I prefer to call them uh, blocking on the name at the moment, but anyway, uh, they are constructional shifts, replicated constructional shifts. The point about replication is important. You need to find more than just one, which is an innovation. Because for me, change is the establishment in a community of speakers, mm -hmm. or writers, of some new uh, form meaning pair. And uh, that, of course, is hard to give evidence for psychologically. Because, as I think I said earlier on, we can't re reconstruct what's going on in people's head mm. many, many centuries ago, or even not this century. <laughs> but uh, there's no hope in doing that uh, for a, a long time ago. So all you can really do is look at the corpora and see do pe people, different people tend to use the same thing. Yeah. So if I'm looking at uh, an example of, or for example, the, uh, if it's a hint, I have studied this a lot, but the example of uh, give something to someone, the prepositional form of the mm -hmm. uh, diatransitive. You don't look for just one example. Yeah. Or if you're looking for um, be going to future, you don't look for just one example. Mm. You have to find, in my view, uh, several different ones. Uh, then you can say this appears to have been conventionalized. That is, uh, various people accepted and entrenched, which means various people are using it. And of course, it may change later. Mm. People tend to think A becomes B. And that's a very, very dangerous thing to mm. think. Because yeah. first of all, there's often an assumption that A goes away. Well, it can. Mm. But it may also not. It may just stay. <laughs> well, right mostly there. it doesn't. Mm. <laughs> mostly it doesn't. So we have be going to meaning um, in motion to go somewhere. And we have going to future. in terms of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, we got both. And this is, I think, typical of all languages. You get richer and richer and richer over time. Mm -hmm. and these discourse markers that I'm looking like at, like all the same. They don't replace anything. People say to me, why? Why are we getting so many of these? Why don't we get rid of redundant old ones? Mm -hmm. Well, it just seems to be a fact of human nature to adopt more and more and more. And for cultural reasons, sometimes uh, some get dropped. There is, after all, mm -hmm. um, Obsolescence. But so in finally we do have some progress then. Um, yeah. I don't think <laughs> obsolescence is, is progress. I mean, if you say that culturally, for example, something that has been studied at great length, uh, various kinds of epistemic markers like in truth, in faith, and so forth have been dropped mm -hmm. for cultural reasons mm -hmm. because in the uh, notion of faith was strong in the Middle Ages mm -hmm. and rejected in the Renaissance in terms of evidence. So you get things like in fact instead of mm -hmm. in truth. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
I think that's partly true. It's partly a kind of cultural phenomenon. Mm. I don't know that it's progress. It's simply change. <laughs> no, yeah, it was just it's just that people <laughs> uh, sometimes just want to say things in a new way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they follow certain cultural concepts. And Susan Fitzmaurice is doing some very interesting work on the idea of cultural concepts and how you can find them by looking at discourses and what is written about, what is talked about, what kinds of uh, collocations there are. So uh, let's see, you asked about constructionalization. Well, yes, that, that is what I'm doing. <laughs> I started doing it in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, not so long ago. And uh, the, the person who first did some work on the construction, constructionalization was uh, Israel. In 1997, he wrote a right. paper mm -hmm. on the development of the way construction and how it changed over time. Another example of expansion and generalization, mm. which is something that we found in, in grammaticalization. I mean, because I moved away from grammaticalization, that's not that what we found was wrong. Mm. It was very right, but it was less than the whole of language. And uh, I think we need to hang on to this idea that over time, some, some structure that has come into being is likely to be generalized and weakened. But it's not exclusively grammatical material, like tense aspect and modality. Yeah. Yeah. It's all kinds of other stuff. It's like this all the same, which is referential to start with. Mm -hmm. This is the same price as that, right? We got still got it. But then you get other meanings and they coexist and they sometimes weaken and sometimes not so clear that all the same really still means, nevertheless. We have to look at the context. Mm -hmm. works. But I do think that my work on pragmatics is probably the most important. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and nevertheless, because the work I do on constructionization for the large part recently has been to do with the development of discourse structuring markers. Okay, just to defend construction grammar here, but uh, a construction grammar would allow you or does allow you to include the pragmatic uh, aspects as well. Right. So, so this oh, yeah. is why I mean, it's, it's such a. It's absolutely fundamental. I mean, some people uh, a few years back, complained that uh, construction grammar didn't have much pragmatics in it. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book called Discourse Structuring Markers of English that came out last year. Mm -hmm. And part of the purpose of writing that book was to instill a bit more pragmatics mm -hmm. <laughs> to constructionalization yeah. and construction grammar. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely a purpose. As I, Going back to what I said at the beginning, I like to try something new. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so in our uh, conversation that we had before uh, this meeting, you said that uh, you may want to uh, revise some of the things that you said about uh, uh, this uh, trajectory from referential to subjective to uh, to intersubjective. And so like on the whole, you still hold on to this trajectory, um, I think. Right? I hold on to... Uh, referential to non-referential. Yeah. I do not restrict it and haven't ever restricted it to development of grammatical markers. When I wrote a book on semantic change with uh, Richard Dasher, mm -hmm. we purposely had a chapter in there on speech adverbs that, you know, I promise or something like that. Uh, the performative use of speech adverbs 
is always, as far as I can tell, historically later <laughs> than the referential. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I would not restrict uh, pragmatic and the development of subjective and intersubjective mm -hmm. uh, pragmatics to grammatical material. Mm. It happens everywhere. Yeah. Now, having said that, I do think there are some things that need to be modified. I, at one point, when I was still thinking grammaticalization, <laughs> mm -hmm. at one point I said that we have a uh, referential, then subjective, and then intersubjective. And various people, quite rightly, pointed out that there are many counterexamples mm -hmm. <laughs> to the last statement there, subjective mm -hmm. to intersubjective. Yes, sometimes that is true, mm -hmm. but not always. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess Gear was one of the people, but many other people have said, you know, that's wrong. Right? And I appreciate that. You know, like one puts out a hypothesis and mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's not testable, it's not interesting. Mm -hmm. right? yes. So people attest, and then, then you look, you can test it yourself, and you can find that you know, that was a bit too strong. Mm -hmm. It's not that no such examples occur. They do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's not a rigid deterministic order at all. Uh, I have... Uh, written some stuff, uh, said some things ab about alternative ways of thinking about that. Mm -hmm. When you have a construction coming into being, you may have some subjectivity and some intersubjectivity at the same time. That book I mentioned about discourse structuring markers in English I conclude that when you get, for example, instead being used not as in the place of, which is what it originally meant, but uh, a contrastive marker, it becomes at least weakly subjective because I, speaker, am making a contrast. Contrast doesn't exist in the mm -hmm. world, as many people have said. It exists. I mean, as many people have said, contrast does not exist in the world. <laughs> and uh, therefore, a contrast is subjective. And if it's a new meaning and a new contrastive meaning, it's got to be more subjective than it was before in its referential sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I, speaker, am putting discourse together. That is a subjective act. So if something comes to be used as a discourse structuring worker, it has to be something that is a bit more subjective than the original referential meaning. But if you think about why you're using a discourse marker, you're not just saying to yourself, mm -hmm. you are connecting discourse A and discourse B, you are actually inviting, back to inviting, mm -hmm. inviting the addressee or reader to share with you the same point of view. Mm -hmm. If I say they got married after all, I'm not even connecting sentences there. I got after all, you know, they got married after all, indicates that I think, or somebody knows, that it was unlikely that they were going to get married. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a cue to you, the address. Inference. So all those discourse structuring markers mm -hmm. are both subjective and intersubjective in my current view. Mm. So you you mentioned that I'm sort of revising my old ideas. That's the old idea that I revised. Mm. Not, they're not sequential. Yeah. 
not one after the other. Mm -hmm. They could be in some circumstances, but it was some sets, some sets of constructions like discourse structuring markers, which are very pragmatic. Uh, some kind of sequence between subjectivity and intersubjectivity makes no sense. You have to think about the function of the unit that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So yes, what I'm doing now, I suppose, basically, uh, tries to combine a new method, a new approach, which is the construction grammar, mm -hmm. old thinking about a pragmatic elements and uh, pra pragmatic factors in uh, language change. Mm -hmm. oh. Great. That sounds like a perfect final sentence, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, j just one like fun question for uh, for the end. So do you, would you recommend to any young person to uh, do historical linguistics? Well, I definitely think it, it's a tremendous amount of potential mm -hmm. in looking at language variation and change. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you don't look at language variation and change, you really have a rather too narrow a view of what language is. And I said at the beginning, why I'm interested in historical work is because it gives you access to the idea that everything changes. Everything is mixed. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, everything changes. Uh, and community, right? So uh, that's that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that we are not like isolated beings, but that a change happens within communities. Within communities, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, there are not too many jobs in historical <laughs> <laughs> linguistics. So uh, anybody getting into, strictly speaking, historical linguistics needs to be aware of that. However, I think if you're doing sociolinguistics of various kinds, pragmatics of various kinds, uh, you can always take a historical look mm -hmm. at what uh at your topic and there's so much rich evidence for recent change now uh, that you don't have to go back to a stage of the language which actually means learning another language <laughs> like if you <laughs> go back to old english you have, strictly speaking you have to learn another language <laughs> somewhat like German, but uh, it's incomprehensible mm. <laughs> to uh, the average reader unless they work very hard at learning it. But uh, this work I've been doing on late modern English, 19th century English, it's, 19th century isn't very long ago, but there's been an enormous amount of change. Mm. Which, very few people recognized when I was an undergraduate and I was looking at history of the language. The history of the language ended at 1830. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so, and people thought nothing changed after yeah. that. Well, a lot of people, Tartu Nebulon and uh, many, many people, particularly in Helsinki, uh, got people thinking about recent English and our many books on the development of 20th century syntax uh, mm -hmm. and the development of modern English. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, I think there's a tremendous amount of work that can be done and there's a great interest mm -hmm. in many people and the more recent history mm -hmm. of whatever language you're looking at. You don't have to just look at English. Mm -hmm. <laughs> look at any language. 
you will find that it has been changing in the last hundred years or so. Mm -hmm. One of the problems I think that people have is that uh, most historical texts, older historical texts are written. And that means we have to accept that our data comes from people who were very elitist mm -hmm. because after all, to be literate, say in the 15th century, was quite exceptional. It's actually quite exceptional still through the 19th century. Mm -hmm. I might say it's somewhat exceptional now, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, there is a problem with the historical data, which is that it's a certain group a certain community mm. of writers and readers, uh, which some people might not be so interested in. Now, there are recordings uh, becoming available from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But since everything changes, if you look at the 20th century, you'll find changes there too. Mm. And so we're into recording material there, and so you can do historical work on uh, recorded speech, and I think that would be fantastic mm -hmm. for a lot of people to do, and uh, unless I'm mistaken, uh, would be of great interest to many, many departments. Yeah. So it would be practically very useful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> For career purposes, yes. Great. So we have a research program lined out uh, now as well. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Well, thank you for interesting questions. <laughs> I think and, this was... If, if anyone wants, wants to ask me questions, uh by email we are welcome to do that uh my email is my last name traga at stanford.edu uh i correspond with a lot of people online so if anything that i've said triggers a question uh please be feel free to ask great thank you so much Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.